All right. Hey there, this is Bram Kanstein and you're listening to Bitcoin for Millennials. Together with the guests on my podcast, I go on a journey to discover how our current financial system works, why it's flawed and why Bitcoin is the most relevant technology that you should understand and adopt. In this episode, I'm joined by Ben Justman. He's a winemaker, entrepreneur and Bitcoiner in Western Colorado. His winery, Peony Lane, is a natural winery in Northern America's highest elevation wine region, specializing in Pinot Noir. Peony Lane has been a Bitcoin business since 2001. And uh, yeah, very cool to talk to you today. I think you're the first person who actually runs a Bitcoin business. So uh, welcome, Ben. Thanks for having me. Since 2021, I wish I was in Bitcoin since 2001. Just got to gotta correct you there real quick. <laughs> Did I say 2001? Oh. No worries. Yeah, oh. yeah. That would be oh, amazing. 2021, yeah. <laughs> 2001, yeah. Before Satoshi started, yeah. <laughs> That, w- that would have been awesome. Um, yeah, so you are building out a winery that your father started. What is it like to continue his work and build the Justman legacy? It feels really nice to be building something long term and building kind of on the. It's a little bit of inspiration for what I'd like to continue with when I have kids and when they grow older is building just off the shoulders of what your parents did. My dad was not a winemaker by trade. He always wanted to retire to a farm and grow all his own food, got convinced to plant grapes, and thus started making wine as a hobby. So he sold wine for a couple of years, made it for himself mostly. And it's it's a bit of me like building off the back of his life's dream, which is sweet because he built houses his whole life. I built a house with him in 2020, 2021. And that hard work ethic is always there. And I always learn from that, but it's very fulfilling to be connected to the land, connected to the seasonal variation, and then also be on my family's property, taking what my dad's dream was and moving it up to a different echelon, a different level than he ever wanted. He never wanted to run a winery or anything. He just wants to, like I said, grow all his own food, drink his own wine. And so I'm just taking that special part of his life stream and turning it into something that I can call my own. Very cool, man. Like, was this always your plan or did that just grow from when he bought the land and ended up there? I always knew that I was going to do my own thing, have my own business, but I never really gave much thought as to what that would be. Kind of just someone who shoots from the hip and lets life take me where, or takes life where it's meant to go in each moment. And I, my town is 2000 people, about an hour away from anything of substance, 30 minutes from a stoplight. And (laughs) I didn't think I would be moving home there until I was like 40 with kids. Cause I always knew I wanted to live there, raise my kids there, uh, whatever that would be, wherever life took me. But I didn't think I'd be moving home at 25 single, starting a business and building my house for the future at that time. So it's definitely a, it was a bit of a, I mean, I won't say surprise cause I definitely planned on it, but was not expecting it. And in hindsight, it feel incredibly lucky and to have get, taken advantage of the opportunity that I did at that time. Awesome. And c- could you tell a bit about Peony Lane? Like, how are you growing it? Like, how is it going now? How are you experiencing growing it? Mm-hmm. In Europe, I don't think you quite have this issue as much. And I'm speaking in a super blanket statement. But in the United States, a lot of wines are made with a ton of additives and um, commercial yeast, tons of preservatives, and that really just leaves you feeling gross after you drink that wine. And so natural wine is, I think you're, a lot of Europeans kind of laugh at that term because that's just wine, especially like in, in nice parts of France and Italy. But in America, it's, it's wine without additives. It's wine made with uh, natural fermentation, wine that's really just going to leave you feeling good and a lot more connected to the land that grew it because the winemaker isn't disrupting the natural flavors um, or aromas with things that manipulate them. So Peony Lane is a smaller winery. I'm I'm producing about 10,000 cases. So most 
I'm trying to expand my my current plantings. I do um, buy a decent amount of grapes from near me in Colorado, but where I'm growing my Pinot Noir is at 5,680 feet. It's the highest wine region in North America, and it's a pretty special place to grow wine. So high elevation wine produces a bit more uh, fruit forward, but like it's really vibrant fruit. And then the acidity is just electric. So you're salivating as soon as you drink this wine, you want another sip. And I'm really trying to let that express itself because I think being the highest elevation wine is a super special thing. Yeah. And people want to try that. And then also I'm using this as a tool to educate people on the wine industry and wine itself and health, how it connects to health, because a lot of people view drinking as this super negative health side effect thing where you're just going to do it because you enjoy it, but you understand it's not good for you. And the ultimate health benefit is really just quitting drinking. When in reality, I think, yeah, each person needs to find their balance. Alcohol can be addicting, but if you're drinking high quality alcohol, especially natural wine, you can do you can use it to enhance your life. You can use it to enhance those special celebrations, um, to relax when you need to at times. And um, if you're really just using alcohol to enhance as opposed to escape, it can be a super healthy outlet if you're drinking high quality stuff. So it's been a quite a journey business wise. I mean, this is realistically like my first serious business. Um, it was I was looking to jump into something that was super committing. And wine is obviously a long time for runway. I mean, two yeah. years before, two years from the initial production investment to actually have a product. And um, it was a lot of waiting, but it's been pretty incredible to be working in a low time preference industry, along with being completely intrigued by a low time preference money. So I've been able to align incentives with peony lane and my interest in bitcoin really nicely hey there thanks so much for listening to this episode i just really want to ask you for a quick favor over the last few months i've seen that only 75 percent of people who listen to this podcast or watch it on youtube are actually subscribed the most important thing i'm currently focusing on next to hopefully giving you interesting conversations is growing this podcast subscriber base so i can continue with it into the future I want to thank everyone who has been viewing and listening to Bitcoin for Millennials, leaving comments here and sending me DMs. It's been super, super motivating. So thank you so much. So I really want to ask you to please hit the subscribe button on YouTube or follow me on your favorite podcasting app if you are enjoying this podcast. Thanks again for joining me on this journey. Now back to the conversation. Yeah, that's dope, man. I, I think we'll get to this, but one of the things that I'm really heavy on with Bitcoin, what you said, like the long long time preference that cannot be created with the fiat money right uh, especially you know you move somewhere you build your house you start a business like those are a lot of things that are uncertain right or new and you have to create the time and space to actually try that right and um, in general most people have a short-term time preference um, it's also well, because they are stuck in the fiat money system, right? But they don't even get the chance to try what you are what you are trying, basically. So I think that's very cool. And yeah, like you mentioned, that <laughs> you have to so wait two I've years. So I mostly produce red wine. And before you... no, you don't have to wait two years. Yeah. But I've found that that is about the minimum amount of time I'd like to wait as far as increasing quality with aging, where mm -hmm. I do one year in oak and then one year in bottle. And I've just noticed a big difference, especially you notice a huge difference in the first six months in bottle. It's really settling in. And then I think it takes it to another level those next six months getting to two years. It's going to continue aging and generally improving for probably the next eight years after that. But yeah, I need to sell some wine. I can't be completely low time preference. So it's a younger minimum yeah. age restriction that I've imposed on myself just based off of um, empirical evidence or um, testing everything. Yeah. And how are people reviewing uh, very it? Very well. Um, I didn't know what to expect and was you know, three years deep as far as financial commitment to this winery, as well as just being three years deep in work commitment. 
before I sold my first bottle. So I had no idea if I was doing the right thing back then and sold out on my first vintage. So uh, that was great because I knew I would also become a better winemaker over time with more experience. And then the next year just scaled even more and have been continuing to scale, opening up into new markets, but also uh, just tons of repeat customers because people love it. And I think that one of the biggest things is I get feedback with people love the flavor of my wine, but that's super subjective. And I think a lot of people will love the flavor, Mm -hmm. but it's hard to pitch like, hey, you'll love this wine over any voice without tasting it. So I always try and give people a taste of my wine whenever possible, because realistically, that's the only way to know. But what I can tell people is that when they drink this wine, they're going to feel good afterwards. They're not going to get hung over the next day and they're not going to get hangovers. And consistently, everyone is blown away by that. And they just, this is their eye-opening, down-the-rabbit-hole moment for wine, where they go back to conventional wine and they feel horrible and they never want to drink that again. So it's a lot of people that are more health-focused or people that have just never even thought about how you don't have to have a hangover when you're drinking alcohol, which honestly still blows me away. Like, my birthday was a couple weeks ago, and I drank a decent amount of wine celebrating and went to bed and thought like whoa just blown away that i didn't even think about worrying about a hangover the next day which blew me away how that's not even part of my mind anymore Mm. um which means i mostly drink my wine so it's it's a pretty wild experience to have (laughs) that just kind of you you get you get the the buzz of the wine and then it's just like kind of slowly and cleanly fades as opposed to leaving you feeling gross where you feel like you have to drink more to keep the buzz going. It's just a slow fade and you just feel clean afterwards. That is a, is a pretty mind blowing experience for a lot of people. Nice. I wish you shipped to I'm Europe stuck in the United States only the, uh, being a Bitcoiner, <laughs> uh, anti-regulation person and then dealing with alcohol regulation is, is quite the headache. Hmm. All right. Well then uh, maybe when I'm around, I'll uh, I'll get a I'll get a bottle. So, when when did you encounter Bitcoin and what was your what was so your I started the like? winery in 2019 and moved home around COVID in 2020. So that means June 2020 is when um, a little bit after things got crazy here in the U.S. And I moved home to start building a house with my dad. So I started these two super low time preference. Uh, massive projects. And before I moved home, I was living in Denver, a big city in Colorado, and was living with a Bitcoiner. But he and I had different political views. We really respected each other morally. I think we had the same morals, but um, he was my contact for Bitcoin. He never tried to orange pill me because he didn't think it was worthwhile. He was still understanding it. Uh, But I remember where I was during the March 2020 crash because he came up flexing and saying yeah or bitcoin so that was my reference point but then i moved home started these big projects and just happened to move in with a really good friend from high school who's who i respected as being super smart and it turns out he was really into bitcoin so he got me questioning because i had questions about the current financial system just being into personal finance in 2019, there was a repo rate spike that caused all my high interest savings accounts to go from 2% interest, which I saw as keeping up with inflation, to 0% interest, essentially. So I knew something was wrong. I couldn't just save my money and have it keep up with inflation. Um, and I was looking. So I was already looking, but didn't know where to look and just happened to move in with this Bitcoiner that pointed me in the right direction. As I'm building this house, I just am listening to four hours of Bitcoin podcasts a day, just having my mind blown. Um, Yeah, so it was really just while I was building the house with my dad, I was having my mind blown about Bitcoin money, um, learning about something that I questioned but never really saw from a different angle. So I listened to National Public Radio, which is um, honestly I view as a propaganda 
radio outlet for the state, or at least in their economic stuff, it's all super Keynesian. And I never had like an outside view from which to view the current monetary system. And so learning about Bitcoin gave me that outside look and just completely flipped my perspective to the way things work today. And I mean, within that, after that, I feel like I'm a completely different person because I got gained this different viewpoint from which, from which to view the world. Wow. And so you said you listened to NPR a lot before, but yeah, now, now you see I it differently. Yeah, now I listen to it and I just like get this rage in, my, in myself because it feels like I'm just being lied to. And oh, I can't wow. believe I listened to that for so long. So what are the, I, I, I love what you said about, you know, the flip, the flip in, in, in worldview, basically, I think a lot of people recognize that. How, how would you pinpoint that? Like, how, how, how would you identify well, that? There's a lot of minute things, but one thing Bitcoin taught me is to view things from first principles and attack. I didn't know what that even was. I'd never heard that phrase before. And so it allowed me to like attack any problem from instead of looking at the, let's say the symptoms, it allowed me to look at the root cause of things. And so um, I just, I stopped like worrying about the big changes and started or the big things happening and started looking at like, okay, okay, what is going on from the base level for a lot of these things? And uh, this is a bit of a vague answer, but um, I just, I mean, my, it's hard to explain, like my entire worldview has changed where I was, I guess, socialism curious in college and then never had really another reason to question that voted for some socialist uh, politicians and then have completely shifted to uh, libertarianism in my move to Bitcoin and starting my own business where um, to me, it just seems like learning about free markets are the solution, quote unquote, solution to many things. They find the best outcome um, in the long run. And uh, that's probably the biggest thing is my, my shift in government and just stemming directly from Bitcoin as um, viewing government money as a bad thing. And then like, how does that affect everything else? Uh, what does taking the power to print money do away from the government due to the government? It shrinks it. Um, and then also, I just, I think just honestly through uh, Twitter and people within Bitcoin kind of finding all these other things, being on the edge of health Twitter and Bitcoin Twitter um, in the natural wine space opened my eyes to a lot of um, health things that I've changed, like pretty much not that I didn't eat meat before, but pretty much going all in on eating a ton of meat and then avoiding seed oils are the biggest things. Um, and those have had pretty dramatic improvements on my health, which have allowed me to take other advances in other ways because health is the base layer of my existence. Yeah. So would you, I, I still like to use this, but I think Bitcoin in a sense, you know, they say it's an orange, orange pill, but it's also kind of like what you said, you approach stuff from first principles. It's very, for me, like understanding Bitcoin is kind of like a rational challenge for yourself, right? Like once you study and you understand certain things, then you also start to think like that. But then you realize that that is the actual like 180 compared to, to before. But once you see it, you cannot unsee it, right? So I don't know, like I use the word matrix. I don't know, people have different ideas with that. But I think it's kind of like, well, once you see it and you cannot unsee it, then you have like this obligation to to yourself, I'd say, you know, am I going to ignore this or am I going to follow it, right? And you, you cannot, uh, how do you say, like you cannot ignore it um, unconsciously anymore like a lot of people do i think right so once you say okay i'm gonna consciously ignore it then your life won't be a lot better right it it will probably suck more if you keep going back to the matrix and you know it's the matrix right it's like the guy in the movie who betrays a neo and the people right like oh mm -hmm. i just want to eat the steak he says right i know it's fake but i still want to eat the steak you know and 
I think it's interesting because actually when you continue going down the rabbit hole of Bitcoin and money and value and property and time preference and all these things, it, for me, but I wonder how it is for you, like it cleared my mind a lot. Like there's a lot of things that I don't pay attention to anymore and it helps me create space and time to yeah go pursue things for like a longer time like just before we started i told you like my goal with the podcast is to make 100 episodes well that's going to take a year but that's okay you know and i have no other expectations i'm just doing my best you know same i think you even have a longer time preference with the wine right but is that something you recognize definitely for it's it's clarified the signal that i pay attention to where i mean i was just getting fed I was really into personal finance and economics. That's what I was listening to um, for entertainment. And it's really clarified the signal for me as far as like the short term numbers just mean so little. I don't need to pay attention to them. I know mm. the trajectory of where things are going, or at least I think I do. And um, it's, I've made my decision. I've I've opted out. Yeah, sure. I could. Um, it takes some prop, like quote unquote profits short term, but honestly, like it's really just, I know to hold Bitcoin, it's interesting to watch the other stuff happen throughout the geopolitics, but it doesn't affect me nearly as much as it did. And that's kind of in a mental space, um, hmm. more than anything, because it obviously affects the price of Bitcoin, but I just don't worry about that i've made my move and now it's really just wait mm. build build the business i have the bitcoin on the side and if both of them win great but if one of them wins if bitcoin wins i'm good if the business wins and bitcoin still hasn't won i'm good um i do think that there's like what we talked about earlier was uh before the show you said i don't really relate to the bitcoin is inevitable and i'm totally with you there i don't believe bitcoin is inevitable i just think it has to win it's imperative and so mm. as you were saying it's it's um it's i feel like i have to align myself with this mission and bring others on board for self preservation because if bitcoin doesn't win I have a much worse worse life. Yeah, I want my friends to get on board and get a lot of gains from Bitcoin. And honestly, selfishly, it feels good to be right. But ultimately, in the long run, Bitcoin just has to win. So I feel like I really have to align myself with this mission and having the time preference of wine, being able to educate on health um, in this other somewhat related rabbit hole, I think is really fulfilling in that I can do everything to one mission, even though there's a bunch of different inputs. Yeah. And when you say Bitcoin has to win, what do you exactly <laughs> I mean by that? I mean that we need to separate money and state. That's just fundamentally, I think for human prosperity, that needs to happen. Um, otherwise, I just, I see it as Bitcoin or slavery. and the argument is like if hmm. what is slavery is 100 percent taxation and so we're you know near 30 to 50 percent taxation in the united states it's higher in other places it's lower in other places but um you could say i'm 50 percent a slave especially when you factor in inflation as part of a part of tax rate so i'm really like i see it as bitcoin or slavery and it couldn't may not be 100 percent slavery but ultimately uh, where's that fine line where you're defined as a slave? I don't want to be any, anywhere near that. And I think separating money from state is the the most important mission in that direction. Yeah. I think it's interesting, right? When you say slavery, like a lot of people will be like, oh, that's a heavy word to use. But I think the point is more that I try to kind of illustrate it always like this way. Like it, it's that other people mm -hmm. influence your life and and you are stuck. Like you cannot do anything about it, right? But it is already 
the case, as you mentioned, uh, I think in my country, it's also between 30 and 50% like in income tax, right? And then you pay taxes on anything you buy again, right? And there's no real, well, the government gets their money, but the, the incentive, like in a business, right? The incentive to spend that money in, in like an optimal way, it's not there because they will get income anyway because the people are stuck <laughs> and they will just keep doing it. Uh, and they are not only stuck because the money is broken, but also because they think that the government is there um, for them, right? And I think in, in practice, um, you know, we both have our own um, viewpoints mm -hmm. from, from where we are from, but, but it's not being spent in an optimal way. And it's also, it's also not voluntarily mm -hmm. in, in a way. Right. And um, I like the idea of, you know, if Bitcoin is the main money, I do believe that there will probably be fiat money next to Bitcoin money. Right. But then we can go back to the people being in charge again, because if the government then wants to tax us, then they have to have really good plans <laughs> and a lot of transparency. Right. Before people are going to part ways with, with their Bitcoin. And I think that that is the power relation that uh, that should be there. Which, which clearly it's not, but you know, like, uh, yeah, in in a Western country, um, you don't really feel that yet, I think, and that is, um, I think, part of the problem, and also why I, I, I uh, you know, why I said like I don't think it's inevitable. We need mm -hmm. to teach people about the problem, right, before we can talk about Bitcoin. And I think one of these problems is that you're stuck. You don't know you're stuck, um, but. Um, yeah, I think that's it's that, the that, the that frog boiling thing, slowly right? where things are getting worse, but they're not getting mm, worse to yeah. the degree that you really take the second to look. And also you're so distracted or working your butt off trying to keep up that you don't have time to look. So it's kind of I've been impressed yeah. by the, the central authorities being able to keep the racket going on this long without people noticing, but as the Bitcoin voices go grow louder as what I see as like you said, you see fiat and Bitcoin coexisting. And yeah, in the short term, like there's no argument to that. But really it comes down to people like me in the producer role that would say, No, I don't accept fiat. And that just destroys the value of fiat if that happens in a large scale. And I'm nowhere near being Bitcoin only yeah. at this point, but I will be one day. Um, I definitely hope to be one day. And if I don't accept fiat and there's a, there's other people downstream and upstream of me that do that before and after, but as that starts happening, there's no going back. Everyone just has to get on the Bitcoin life raft. And I think it's coming faster. It'll, it'll continue to come faster. It's, you know, technology adoption, as we've all seen the curves of technology adoption in other senses. Uh, money is the most viral technology. But it just seems like things are getting crazier. People are stepping back and there's so many more Bitcoiners in the world and so much more awareness of Bitcoin. I mean, this is the if if we get a bull run this happening, if you call it a bull run right now, whatever, um, this is the third one that most people have been aware of. Maybe they heard of the 2013, 2014, but they heard of the 2017, 2018 and they heard of the 2021. And mm -hmm. so this is the third time that people will have heard of it. There's so many more people involved. The signal is so much clearer. There's people doing awesome podcasts like yours to educate. Um, and I mean, we're out there prof, uh, just s like spreading the Bitcoin message to everyone that can hear that there's going to become a, a steamrolling effect moment where the ball just starts rolling down the hill and crushes everything. Um, very quickly, it seems like, and we'll see when. I have no idea, but to me, I'm I'm just incredibly bullish on people taking the time to understand it or buying some to understand. Uh, I've found people to be much more accepting or open to it recently compared to when I first was really trying to go after it for people. Maybe it's time in the market. Maybe it's their understanding and trust of me 
maybe it's my business doing better and that being proof of work for my own education and skills. But um, it seems like we're hitting an inflection point in society to me. Yeah. So from your experience talking with others about Bitcoin, what do you think is the like the biggest mental hurdle that most people need to get over before researching or, or Why? adopting Bitcoin? That's the biggest hurdle. Why should I care about this? And mm. it's hard because I want to pre I want to pitch it as like an opt out, a you know a, a low risk play. Um, when I explain Bitcoin, it's that the price of goods should decrease all the time, and if you have a fixed money supply, that works. But everything, every bit of inflation is both that deflation plus the rate of inflation in in theft away from us um in what those prices should do basically bitcoin is just this huge it's an amazing answer and it poses all these gigantic questions that are so hard for people to understand that you have to have a serious why for diving into it when i was helping my friends with personal finance before i found bitcoin um just helping them with budget, get the right bank accounts, credit cards with good cash back, all that stuff, just the basic financial things. Um, I noticed that people had no idea. And I've continued that. That knowledge was a great baseline for my orange pilling because it's let me think like I don't overestimate what people know. Uh, people don't understand inflation. They don't understand money. Um, they have had no reason to really question it. But once you do have that reason, once you do have that why, it's, I hope the seed of Bitcoin has been planted. Like I had the why, but I didn't have the Bitcoin seed. And once that Bitcoin seed came to me, I really dove into it and prospered. Granted, I was already super interested in this stuff. Most people aren't. But I found that I just want to be, I want to be clear signal, Bitcoin only. I want to be the Bitcoin guy in your life. And when you do get that why, I just want to make sure you know that I'm the person to come to. And that, that that means like having a clear head, not being irrational about things, not being over bullish or just crazy, like yelling about the fiat system. It means kind of just being a level headed, normal person that is really into Bitcoin and is showing some level of success in it, whether that be my brand and associating that with Bitcoin or like price gains. And I mean, I hopefully not talk about that too much uh to my friends but like that's the truth is if you want to escape this debt slavery system you're also going to get a lot of price gains as bitcoin monetizes so i'm seeing a lot more reasons to question the system and i think that's a huge why for a lot of people so i'm really just hoping to plant the seeds be that guy that is there for people when they do start asking questions because when they do start asking questions bitcoin is an obvious answer but most people don't even think to look. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. So what's your experience talking with other millennials? Do you do you see a difference in like age groups? But well, of course, mm -hmm. I'm especially interested in millennials. Like what, what is your experience? So I, I talk to a lot of boomers and I talk to a lot of younger people and the boomers are like my dad, my dad's friends, all these people that were like relatively successful about real estate, did things the way things used to be and rode the general generational wave with real estate to um, end up perfectly fine in their retirement. And these people are, I'm speaking super generally, these people are a bit more checked out. This worked for me, why won't it work for you? Um, as you get older, you stop questioning things. You just, you know, you figure out yourself um, not that you totally stop questioning things, but like it's harder to develop, to dive into new technology. And these people just I think I'm crazy um, and almost are like mad that I would question their the system that works so well for them. Um, mm -hmm. I don't. <laughs> but then like whenever I have, for instance, when I sell wine, a lot of times people will come up to me because I have a Bitcoin preferred sign on my stand. And they'll either ask why I prefer Bitcoin or tell me, be careful, buddy, it's down 50%. And I then like I tell them <laughs> I prefer Bitcoin because I prefer its monetary policy is something that I've I've been saying. And 
the that's great response i, I get that. to that is what does that mean and I'm sitting here like, dude, you are in Aspen, Colorado. You clearly have money and you have no idea what monetary policy is. That's there's a reason for that. Like you escaped, you did fine with your life, but the whole there was no education to understand money. So that's my experience with boomers. With with millennials, a lot of times it's like um they've heard of it. They know friends that lost a bunch of money in crypto. They probably lost a bunch of money in crypto. And they're like, shame on me for getting fooled. I don't want to do this again. Um, and also, they're super busy. I mean, to make it in this world is, it takes a lot of work. And I mean, as we're just further down the Fiat Ponzi, it's like these people are working their, their butts off to, to make it. Maybe they are, maybe they aren't, but they don't have much time. And so they don't have time to ask to dive deep. And I'm just this guy that's like preaching about this thing that they assume is bad or they've lost money in um, something adjacent. And all I'm really trying to do is be like Bitcoin, not crypto. And when you're curious, come to me because eventually these people will be curious. Yeah. And it's also a lot of time with my friends, especially like I'm not here to burn bridges. I'm not here to go hard on something. I'm not here to ram it down your throat. Because I know that if I come at you hard about Bitcoin, which I have in the past, like I'm guilty of that, uh, you're not going to be receptive of it. So I've relatively like kind of just closed my orange pilling circle and not really reached out about it. Everyone knows that I'm into it because for two years, I it was all I could talk about. I was going crazy, having my mind blown. But I've realized that personal success especially with what I'm doing in leaning into Bitcoin with my wine brand is the best way to orange pill because people want to emulate success. And if I'm someone sitting here who yeah, started a winery, tells them that I bought the top of both Bitcoin tops in 2021 um, and wrote it all down as a way to show conviction, they're not really going to trust me as someone who has a good, um, is a good barometer for success. So really, I've just kind of tried to to buckle down and prove my correctness in the hard way the way that takes too a long time and um hopefully they'll figure out a way to or they'll figure out a reason to ask why eventually yeah i love that man i love what you said about the monetary policy i uh we are we are currently recording on the eve of the halving right and i think that is the halving for me is an example of that, right? There's a monetary, part of the monetary policy is this issuance schedule. And what we are going to see in, uh, I don't know, five-ish hours from now, six-ish hours from now, is that what has been advertised to us, uh, quote-unquote advertised, is still being followed, right? The rules that are proposed that anyone can see, that anyone can um, yeah, well, see before they participate, right? That anyone that does participate needs to adhere to and that anyone who participates knows that all the other people that participate also adhere to it, right? That's the entire point. Um, that that is still valid and still enforced and still accepted, right? And um, I think that is so fascinating because that policy, the policy is nothing more than the set of rules, right, to adhere to that that is still being followed like that is i think what we are celebrating right and if you compare that to fiat money like what is the monetary policy of 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 the us dollar well uh, you know every quarter you wait for what uh, what jerome powell is going to say basically and if you look back 30 years or even 15 years it's uh, it's not consistent at all and i think that's a uh, yeah i love that man i'm going to i'm going to use that i think that's a great Great illustration. Well, and, and with regards to the millennials, do you feel like a lot of people? Um, I actually, I ended last week. I ended up on the millennials uh, subreddit on uh, on Reddit, and it was really sad. Actually, it's really nihilistic. Like a lot of people are not positive. I think I am very positive. I I, I am not. I don't have a nihilistic outlook. Um, I think I'm serious and inquisitive. Like uh, I think 
some stuff is really messed up, right? But I do see a positive future. But when I look, uh, I looked on that subreddit. It was crazy. I scrolled back a few weeks, and it's just really, yeah, kind of like also what you just said. Like, oh yeah, I know people that lost money in crypto, or I lost money in crypto. Not only that, but it's just like, man, it's bad. Um, it's a losing thing, or you know, Ben, you're a sucker, or stuff like that. Like, it's not. It's not positive. Like, is that something you yeah, experienced so that's, too? That's where I'm leaning into the trying to create a positive why to get into Bitcoin, where so many people, they their relationship with it is they lost money, their friend lost money. And they're also just like generally associating crypto and Bitcoin together. So they lost money on some doggy coin, therefore Bitcoin mm -hmm. is bad. Or they read an article in the New York Times that said Bitcoin is bad for the environment or whatever it is that's their relationship with bitcoin because they haven't had the the reason to go super deep into bitcoin and learn about it they definitely have not dove into fiat monetary policy because that is just an endless quagmire there's no understanding it and so both with my personal experience of like i want to be successful and i want to i want my friends to view me to be successful there and view bitcoin as a huge reason that i'm successful so that they like that's just how humans work is you want to emulate success and so i want to prove that that out but then also when i'm selling wine and i have that bitcoin preferred sign the biggest thing i want to do there because i don't expect to a lot of bitcoiners pay with bitcoin but when i'm out in the more like not bitcoin twitter when i'm just out in the real world the number of Bitcoiners is low. So I don't expect a ton of Bitcoin <laughs> sales. Um, but what I want to do with that, that's my spread the message. And my spread the message is really, one, be a touch point. See Bitcoin out in the world, realize that it is a thing out in the world. It's not just this internet thing that people gamble on. And two, associate Bitcoin with a high quality product and a good local business. So associating Bitcoin with something that people perceive as good to balance off all the propaganda that quote unquote Bitcoin is bad. And I've found, you know, it's a long-term game. Like I'm not expecting to orange pill people. I don't have time to orange pill people when they walk up and ask me questions uh, for the most part, because I'm trying to sell wine. But if I can just be a touch point and yeah. get people to see Bitcoin in a slightly more positive light or just in the real world, I think it makes a huge difference overall. And so I always just encourage Bitcoiners to find a way to do that. Um, I totally understand wanting to be anonymous or low profile with Bitcoin. Like if that's your answer, if that's your response, like by all means do it. But if you want to just further the message of Bitcoin, um, even with people you don't know, it's really just uh, find ways that you can associate Bitcoin with positive things in your life or just put it out there into the world and let it be a touch point for people. Because I mean, Lord knows like, Bitcoin came into my life so many times before I ever really wanted to dive into it. I mean, we all could have bought Bitcoin and when we first heard about it, but we didn't until we learned about it. And so mm. it takes so many touch points that if you can just be an extra touch point, increase that connection to Bitcoin that most people have, um, I think it makes a huge difference in the long run. But sorry, on the nihilism. Yeah. So what's your belief? Um, I yeah. agree with you and was de I'm yeah. also a very positive person who struggled with that because the world did seem like pretty doomed. But in studying Bitcoin, mm -hmm. one, I realized the root problem was fiat money and also a solution to that huge root problem and gave myself a, view a way to view the system from outside the system. So. Yeah, Bitcoin has been my beacon of hope. It's been my ability to like see past all this craziness that's happening in the world. And I see that nihilism in people my age and younger as well. Anyone who actually like who pays attention to what's going on in the world, but through that really just means watches propaganda um, is extremely nihilistic or they just believe that there's going to be some great savior when it comes to a politician that's going to change everything, which I mean, I think I'm on the younger tranche of millennials and the it, as you get older you're just going to see that that's not going to work you're not going to get this perfect politician that's going to change everything yeah. and maybe it'll just take a few more elections for people my age to realize that but they will probably and 
I mean, I hope that Bitcoin could give them hope because as I've seen, and probably you've seen interviewing other Bitcoiners, if not in yourself, like understanding Bitcoin changes so many things in your life in a lot of positive ways. And it's, it's just an awesome thing for me personally. So I expect it to be an awesome thing for a lot of people, which makes it an awesome thing for the world. And I want to spread that bright orange light. Yeah, I love that, man. So you, you talked about not getting into Bitcoin when you first heard about it. Like what, was there a belief or, or were there more beliefs that made you like not get into it, right? Like nobody gets it on the first <laughs> encounter, right? Um, not necessarily just factual, like understanding how it works, but it's usually like personal beliefs that, that hold you back. Yeah. Um, I really, when it, so when I was first getting into it, I was like, okay, cool. So that's a hedge. You're hedging against these, against like hyperinflation, basically. Um, to my friend that I considered really smart. And I was like, cool, that's fine, man. But like all of your investments, you have gold, you have silver, like all of your investments are just hedges against this system, sy systemic collapse. Uh, so then I started looking into it and realized that that was kind of a given. Like it's not necessarily hedging against this system collapse that will come. It's hedging against the financial collapse that is currently happening at all times when they're printing money. Um, like I said, with just my political beliefs before I found Bitcoin, I, I didn't, I thought like the answer to my, the problems in the world was more government. And now I'm realizing, in my opinion, it's less government. But if we're taught, and like, I have opinions on the right government, all that stuff, but realistically, like, who am I? I don't know. All I know is let's take the power to print money away from them. Let's, let's align the incentives a bit more and then see where the, see where things go. Uh, because that's already such a massive change. So, no, I mean, I heard about Bitcoin and like, yeah, I mean, the 2011, 2014, sometime in there, it looked it up. It looked, it was like a sketchy website. No, I'm not going to buy that. That's, and it, I mean, it was so much more like it was harder <laughs> to get. There was no education around it um, generally. And um, yeah, 100%. Also, it was just less proven. I mean, we're 15 years in at this point. Like, it's a lot better. I mean, it's almost as old as yeah. the euro. But, um then in 2017 i bought bitcoin in order to buy the xrp pico top so rode that down rode ethereum down didn't have any bitcoin and didn't really think about it um at all for four years and then finally when i lived with a bitcoiner um just learned about it a little bit um really dove into it and never really had a a questioning i mean i had a ton of questioning moments in my understanding why am i going all in this is crazy um but i at least was guided in the bitcoin only from the beginning and i had a couple bitcoiners in my life um that i was able to like think okay this guy's into it i'm not totally crazy i'm always astonished by the people who don't have any bitcoiners in their in their real life like real connections too because it was just such a life flip for me such an intense educational process that I can't imagine not having anyone else to go through that with or just to bounce off mm. ideas with, man. Because, I mean, what are, like, it's already pretty isolating to have different beliefs from everyone, but from literally everyone in your life, everyone in your life, not even just like a couple people, is, is wild to have that conviction. And I, I commend everyone who's, who's done that. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. Just before we started, I told you, like, I think by a real life circle, like, well, now a bit more. I used to have just like two, maybe now I have like five people that I really talk about um, with it, you know, but it's it's still, I don't know, you said like different beliefs, but I think the beliefs come after the understanding, right? And um, so that understanding part is just the biggest thing uh, and, and what we touched upon before. Like when you understand it, then you also see things that other people don't see, right? And so that is what changes, um, what changes your beliefs there. And uh, yeah, I agree. I, I think that is lonely in a sense that 
I don't know how that's for, for you, but I really experienced like, because it's lonely and you are sometimes the only one, right? In a certain time span or that you think like, okay, am I really the only one that figured this out? And I really also know how this sounds when people who are not into Bitcoin listen to this, like, oh, this guy got it figured out or something. <laughs> you know, so it's, yeah, it's classic, but like that is lonely. And mm -hmm. then you start doubting yourself, right? Because, yeah, well, why, why would I be the only one here that figured it out, right? But then it's really interesting to actually, and also one of my main motivations to start this podcast, basically, is that so many different types of people from so many different backgrounds and age groups, mm -hmm. they figured out the same thing, right? And they all have different roads to the same conclusion. And that is basically what fascinates me so much. Uh, I don't know if you've been to conferences, but if you go been to two bitcoin conferences it's wild it's wild to see all these different people that are into the same thing and i think then it feels so much less lonely and actually very inspirational that that you know that this is like across social class across all these different um levels of of people basically and um then it feels way less lo mm -hmm. way less yeah, lonely I yeah I very much yeah, relate to that. Um, one thing that helps my conviction in the face of all the doubt is, I mean, it takes a certain person, um, this aside, like, I just kind of have a bull head. And when people tell me not to do something, I do it until I realize that for myself that it's wrong and like to learn the hard way. But um, one thing that really helped me was a lot of the people that were calling me crazy or that I was trying to pitch Bitcoin and were like, no, you're stupid. Um, were the people that I helped in their personal finance. Um, and so I knew their level of understanding and so just didn't take it Funny. that seriously or, or knew in my, my conviction had mm -hmm. something. Um, but what you spoke to with the, the community of Bitcoiners is I went to my first conference in the, the one in Miami in 2022. And I had a couple Bitcoiners in my life and I'd orange pilled one person, but like realistically none had no connection to the Bitcoin community was just getting on Twitter and just had that experience and dove in because I found such an incredible group of people. And what was really infectious in, I think is, is what links so many people together. Yeah. Um, we all understand Bitcoin, but it's the thing that you brought up with millennials and seeing the nihilism is I didn't see any of that at a Bitcoin conference. I don't see that in Bitcoiners. I see tons of hope. And I'm a firm believer of you are an amalgamation of, you know, whatever five closest people you spend your time with. And so I take that very seriously. And if there's an extremely toxic person in my life, no matter how long I've owned, I've known them, I, I'm not interested in having that in my life. I want to build towards positivity and people that are with people that are doing amazing things. And just going to a Bitcoin conference and seeing the insane amount of hope, positivity, and drive to make the world a better place, make their lives better, um, and just be a good person um, because they have low time preference, it is addictive. So I've just been trying to connect with as many Bitcoiners as possible ever since then and have like leaned my business completely into that. Um, and that's like both a, yeah. a social layer. I want to meet more Bitcoiners, but also the, the connectivity stuff and the being a, a touch point for non Bitcoiners that I spoke about earlier. Yeah. I love that. That's great. So with your business, with Peony Lane, like you are running it as a Bitcoin business, but what does so that look unfortunately, like? It, it, it's kind of funny because I prefer Bitcoin and I have a sign that says I prefer Bitcoin when I'm selling in person, but there's a lot of centralization when it comes to liquor licensing within the 50 states. So if I were to want to ship hmm. to all 50 states, I would need 50 liquor licenses. All the states require different things. Obviously, money at my size, it's not realistic. So I use a third-party platform that acts as a middleman. Basically, I sell the wine to them. They sell the wine to the end customer, but the end customer thinks they're buying it directly from me. That middleman, I just pay them a percentage. It's hmm. very, it's a high percentage, but it's very worthwhile to have access to the entire, all of the United States. 
Um, but since they run all my sales, I've been begging them for three years to allow me to accept Bitcoin and they don't allow me to directly on the site. So I've been working on a solution, um, but it's still, every time I accept Bitcoin, I have to manually input an order and put it as cash to through this other system. Um, I've just been accepting Bitcoin orders basically through DMs and in person. And given that extra friction, it's insane the amount of people that have wanted to pay in Bitcoin. Um, like it's, I'm, it's wow. not, a, a huge amount, but it's such a high percentage, especially considering that friction of people that just want to support Bitcoiners. Uh, and they know that the, the best way to support Bitcoiners is with Bitcoin, because I, I don't know. A lot of people probably haven't experienced this. Um, it's really cool to pay with Bitcoin. But the coolest thing is getting paid for your work in Bitcoin. You really feel valued. And you also it's like, yeah, great. The best money ever for my product. But I could also just like accept dollars and convert yeah. that instantly to Bitcoin. So what makes it really special is that I know how much that person values their Bitcoin. They view it as worth over a million dollars. And like, what are they doing spending it now at 60,000 on some wine? And so I know how much that Bitcoin means to them. Yeah. And that translates into an amazing feeling as far as like, wow you really value my wine you really want my business to succeed um uh, and it's been pretty consistent i mean bitcoiners are just a an amazingly supportive group from within and um there's obviously like some prickliness you know um we don't we there's so many scams around bitcoin there's so much negativity thrown at them that you kind of develop this defensive shell but within that defensive shell within a strong bitcoin community is so much love and supportiveness um it's pretty amazing to experience Yeah, I think that's a great illustration, right? I, I think I talked about this with uh, Peter Dunworth on the that, that was the second episode of this podcast. Like once you realize and understand that Bitcoin is the hardest money to ever exist, which translates to the best money to ever exist, right? Then in order to earn that money, you have to actually deliver real value, right? If 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 you if people have Bitcoin to pay for goods and services, then they're going to be very critical and very, um, mm -hmm. how do you say, well, not judgmental, but they want value before they give away their Bitcoin, right? And I think the people who, who you're now selling to, they understand that value, like you said, like they see it as a million bucks, but they still spend it. And um, I think it's really cool that you share that because I, I, mm -hmm. I don't know anyone who's already experiencing this, right? Like selling their 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 products for bitcoin but that is eventually where we're gonna go and that yeah it's gonna take some time but there has to be a turning point where enough people understand this that you know they're also all yeah. going to say it's not going to come from the customers and then more, side and more people where will be buying yeah like people want to pay with bitcoin mm. but and that'll push some producers to accept bitcoin just because it's another revenue stream it's another way to accept money and sure it's if you're paying on lightning like the the percent fees are super low but you're also dealing with a monetize, monetizing asset that swings in value a ton so like losing you could save three percent on fees but then lose 20 percent overnight in value so that's not really a selling point i see it as like it's more of a pull effect where people producers that produce high value goods and can get bitcoin that's where it starts that is those are the people that will first be able to say no bitcoin only and that just continues on down the chain because you want money yeah. that you can save especially as it get, gets worse and uh you just made me made me think of something fun that is you asked me early on what's the what's the reception to your product your wine do people like it all that stuff and I think just the way this conversation has gone, I could answer that as simply as just by saying people are willing to pay me Bitcoin for it. That's how much people like my product. I love that. Yeah. Well, that shows a certain amount of quality, right? Of value, uh, uh, or, or at least up until now, the perception of value, right? But I think 
if we go back to talking about what is the problem that people should understand that they have is basically, and I think you are a great example, right? In making wine, you spend two, three years making X amount of bottles of wine, right? And all that time is gone and the energy is gone. You know, your physical energy and the energy from the sun that went into the grapes and of, you know, the oak wood that got turned into barrels and all this shit. Like, it's all, everything you see around you, right, costs energy to maintain or create. So you are creating this wine. I think it's the one of the ultimate examples of how lots of different types of energy are actually condensed in a bottle and, and in the wine, right? And you do all this work for three years, basically, and then you start selling it. So three years of work is in that in that bottle, but the time you spend on it, that is gone, right? That is the most scarce thing that everyone has, right? The time, we don't know how much time we have. And then, you know, if you start selling these these bottles, you want to receive a reward for it. And in, in fiat money, at the moment of transaction, right? If I, I don't know how much your bottles are, right? Mm -hmm. But let's say it's yeah. 50, 80 dollars. I don't know how much. <laughs> yeah, something like that, right? If we agree at that moment, I'm at your stand, right? I give you the dollars and you give me the wine. At that, that's the only moment in time when that exchange is equal. Because after that, I take the wine home. I still have, I have all this energy that's captured in the bottles, right? And I drink the wine and I consume the energy in a sense, right? So, but on your side, I gave you the dollars and just programmatically on purpose, you lose 2% of the energy I gave you every year. Well, in reality, it's way more. I don't know the effective uh, <laughs> um, inflation, mm -hmm. but it's probably near near the 8 10% uh, range. And you start losing that energy basically and yeah i'm really like on this path of kind of how my, my where my mind is and explaining people this but this is the entire point why would you want to be rewarded in something the um, you know you use the finite asset your time to create something and you mm -hmm. are rewarded with an infinite asset with something that can be created infinitely that sounds like such a stupid Value exchange no, great from for your you. side, <laughs> not from my side, right? If I'm the customer. <laughs> yeah. And so, of course, you as the creator of something, right? You are more productive than me in, mm -hmm. in this exchange. Well, yeah. maybe I, I also, of course, got the money from somewhere, but still, you know, you would want to be rewarded in something that can hold the energy that we agree to, you know, as to what it's worth on the moment of of exchange and i think that is what the use case of bitcoin is that you can earn that energy in the form of money of bitcoin as money and that you can keep it towards the future so you can actually build your business that costs more time and energy to also actually build because you want to make a new batch of wine etc right and yeah i just mm -hmm. i i i don't know i hope that came across well but that like that is really kind of the thought line where I'm on to also share with people who are, and again, I think you're the prime example. You know, the hardest people part that with that. time and energy into something. The, just the hardest part with that. You want to be fairly because rewarded. I explain that too. I mean, that's, you're hitting the nail on the head, but the hardest part is then people see the price swings. And what you're explaining is the long-term benefit of Bitcoin. But we're in a monetization phase, mm -hmm. and I think that trips a lot of people up. That why would, why is Bitcoin the best money if it doesn't hold its value specifically? And the it's really hard to explain that it does hold its value within the network, but the network is gaining and losing value perceptively um, on the margins at all times. And so it's it makes the world a better place when we all adopt it because we all slowly gain money, but or gain value for our money. But in the short term, it's really, it's can be phrased as a speculative, speculative play. It's just, we figured out the end game and also have decided that this needs to happen. It's not a, it's not a guess. It's a, we need to make this happen. Mm. So it's, I think it'll be easier and easier to explain yeah. and um, get people on board. But in the short term, it's really watch out for yourself, stack as much Bitcoin as you can. <laughs> 
Yeah. Yeah, true. I I generally reply mm-hmm. to that with, you know, like what is your time frame? And then we can get also, you know, into that part of the conversation that we also touched upon like, okay, but if your time frame is a year, like how are you building out your life? You know. But if your time frame is, mm-hmm. you know, 4 or 5 years, every 4 or 5 years I want to build to something or achieve something. Well, then Bitcoin is the best place to store your energy, right? Um, so I 100% agree, but then I try to go that way because that is also like one of the parts to, I think, discover about yourself first, right? What, what is actually my time preference, right? Like how far do I look into the future? How much time do I buy for myself or create for myself to actually also work towards that future? So then you mm-hmm. kind of also also get there. But um, yeah, I agree. In a very short, short term, um, I think, yeah, the monetization shows uh, that uh, it goes up and down. Um, Yeah, so how, now that you understood Bitcoin, you're building a business, you're building a legacy for the family, how how has Bitcoin influenced your approach to like risk-taking or financial Um, risk? risk taking i was always super low risk how do you feel about it's that kind now? of funny that i i also lump bitcoin into the low risk category because i understand it and it's obviously super risky to invest in something that you don't understand and there's i mean realistically no understanding the current financial system for all the energy i put into listening to podcasts about it but i was always index funds savings accounts um and then the lowest risk investment is betting on myself because the downside is that I've learned and you can't put a value on that. So it's, I've been, I was always super into skiing and, and taking risk there. And I think it's just kind of, that's decreased as I've taken on more responsibility with, um, and just gotten older and more mature, I believe, um, with the winery and everything. So I think, Bitcoin came to me at the perfect time when I was ready for it, as it tends to do for a lot of people. Um, I learned a lot of lessons by getting, by enjoying the drawdown um, after going all in at the tops. And it's, I'm just like really looking forward to the future now that it feels like I've built both a strong, I mean, I found Bitcoin, built my house, and um, started the winery all around the same time. And after four years of that, it really feels like I have a strong foundation to move forward with. So Bitcoin is really just a huge part of the strong foundation I've built um, to take the rest of my, to build the rest of my life on. And I'm really excited for the future. Yeah, I love it, man. I would describe myself the same. I always say like, I'm a control freak and a very low risk person like very risk averse, actually. What you just said is funny. Lowest, the lowest risk is investing in yourself because you always learn. You just taught me that. Well, you just taught me how I always have fought, but you, you put that in words. That's amazing. I love that. See, that's why I love the podcast. Like I, I learn a lot, but yeah, like I always saw that way. Like I always, uh, personally, I saw like money is like buying time to then invest in yourself. Um, yeah, very cool how you just worded that. That's dope. But yeah, I, 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 for me, Bitcoin is the most rational choice. And rationality, I think, is kind of part with, you know, lowering risk, right? You try to think through, through stuff to eventually make the most rational des- decision, which is, you know, never 100%, of course. But for me, going all in on Bitcoin is just like, yeah, it's the most rational thing to do. And anything else that I come across, what could be an alternative to save in or invest in, however you view that, right? It's all eventually inferior. And yes, that comes from the current understanding, right? But for me, it really freed up my mind because... I just stick with one thing. It goes up, I sit on my hands. It goes down, I sit on my hands. Like, I don't, Mm -hmm. like, I can actually put that time into myself now. But before that, and I do agree, uh, I think that's a big thing. It it takes lots of time and you have to have the time to actually study, right? I mean, you illustrated you were building the house and you have four hours a day listening to podcasts. Yeah. Lots of people just Mm -hmm. don't have four hours a day to listen to, to podcasts, right? So, 
but still you chose to listen to those podcasts in the time that that you had right so um yeah i love that um you know you have to do the work up front but after that um yeah i think it frees your mind and and actually lets you let you build all right man well to to wrap it up uh the last question i and i ask everyone the same question and that's what's a core belief that you will never let go wow um <laughs> that's a deep one to finish on i love it Uh, <laughs> I think the thing I've come back to the most is really, as we were just hitting on betting on yourself. Um, my dad always said to me, something that stuck with me was I never regretted things I did. I only regret things I didn't do. And it's kind of a speak to mm. trying new things. That's the obvious thing, but there's entrepreneurship is very much not for everyone, but you can bet on yourself in a lot of different ways. And I think that if you live your life, not trusting your gut, not living your truth. And part of that is you have to find what that actually means to you that, you end up living with a ton of regret. And so that's like one of the biggest things that got me to start the winery was I knew I wasn't like this. If I failed, I was young and had plenty of time to, to recover. But ultimately, I needed something that forced me to bet on myself and kind of like prove who are you, Ben? Like, what are you? What are, you think you're so great? Cool. Put yourself in the market and figure it out. And so. I just, it's not all entrepreneurship. It's not all just trying to flip at new things, but I think believing in yourself and following that and really sticking to it and having firm ground and also recognizing when you're wrong is a super powerful part of it. So roundabout way to answer your question, but that's what I was thinking about. Love that, man. Thanks so much for sharing. Um, yeah, thanks so much for this conversation. I, I really enjoyed it. I will link to your Twitter X profile, link to Pini Lane website for people to buy your wine. Awesome. Thanks for having me. And uh, yeah, man, let's stay in touch. Thanks so much. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, it would be amazing if you could rate, review, and subscribe on the podcast platform of your choice. It will help us educate more millennials on the importance of Bitcoin. You can follow and connect with me on Twitter. I'm Bramke. That's at B-R-A-M-K. And if you are or know someone who has an interesting perspective on Bitcoin that's worth sharing, hit me up. I read and reply to every single message. I appreciate your support and hope you'll be here for the next episode. Thanks for listening. Bye.